lead of the OpenStack networking project, uh, formerly Quantum, but our official name is OpenStack Networking. Um, code name will be changing over the next few weeks, so you'll see announcements about that when all that's all set up and done. Uh, real quick, I just want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, you know, been very gracious, and very the hosts have been very awesome to me. So, let's talk a little about uh, a little bit about OpenStack networking. Uh, real quick, one of the things um, as we've kind of touched on is OpenStack is really. While I'm the PTL of the project, it's really a team that helped builds this. Um, one of the things is we have developers all over the world. Um, the project is constantly being developed on at all hours of the day. I go to bed at night, I wake up in the morning, my email box is filled with changes, bugs, blueprints, new ideas, all kind of work always is going on all the time. And without a dedicated core team, this would never be possible. Um, here in Israel, you're lucky. You actually have one of the members of the core team, uh, Gary Cotton, actually lives here. And so Gary is a workhorse for our team. <laughs> so one of the challenges that we have in networking, and the reason the OpenStack Networking Project was born, was how do we tackle some of the challenges that we have in the cloud? Um, you have high density multi-tenancy in a public cloud. You can also have high density in even private deployments. Maybe you have multiple departments you have and you're trying to consolidate data centers or consolidate deployments. Um, you can use VLANs, but you only get 4,000 of them. And if you're using the right equipment, you really only get 3,000 of them. So, you know, you have to kind of deal with the issues with that. Um, you want on-demand provisioning. You know. Earlier, Rackspace mentioned it took them 10 days to provision a server. Nowadays, people want servers, networks, and they want them instantly. And with Quantum, we work in OpenStack networking, we work to kind of speed up that process. You know, the traditional network solutions require, you know, manual configuration, manual connection. You know, cable's got to be plugged into the switch, the server's got to be racked, it's got to be cabled up, and then hopefully the guys working in the data center have appropriately cabled your server. I'm sure we've all been there. They tell you it's all cabled, and you run LLDP, and it's nowhere to be found on the switch. So we also need a place to move capacity workloads, um, as well as you know the network state, the address needs to be able to be portable. One of the things we talked about a little bit earlier, which is HA, what's the story? Um, if you have a, a hypervisor that goes down, you need the ability to move that workload within the data center without having to rewire or reconfigure your data center. Um, because that involves downtime. Tackling these challenges, network virtualization, software-defined networking. Um, we can use overlay tunnels. We can use MVGRE. Uh, VXLAN is coming in. OpenStack Networking currently. STT, some of our uh, vendors use that. Um, you know, there's other solutions, QFabric, FabricPath. The reason I include question marks is because our vendors are innovative and they're always coming up with new ideas and new ways to tackle these problems. And, you know, the things I'm talking about today in six months, I may be mentioning different technologies as vendors work on them and implement them and add them. So really, what is OpenStack networking at its core? If we, you know, the first thing we have to take a look at is kind of some basic abs abstractions. Um, what you have is you take a look at the top with Nova. Um, I actually skipped that. How many people are familiar with the internal, not really internals, but just the basic abstractions of OpenStack of VMs? OK. So we have Nova. You have your virtual servers. Um, each of those virtual servers has a virtual interface. Um, for those not familiar, it's just the same equivalent of the NIC that you would plug in, a, in into physical hardware. Um, and we have virtual ports, which are the same as a physical port on a switch, essentially, in a, but they're logical. And then we have L2 networks. Um, an L2 network, if you're not familiar with the OSI networking stack, is really just the wires that connect if you were to plug everything into a switch. And then lastly, uh, virtual subnets. And the subnets is really an L3 abstraction for the IP addressing. So what Quantum does is it allows you to take a lot of the pieces from the virtual ports, the L2 networks, and the um, virtual subnets, and orchestrate those and also manage those um, seamlessly. And there is part of Quantum and Nova which have to interact, which is where the virtual interface comes in, whether you're using um, KVM or Zen or another virtualization technology. At that point, you have to know how to plug the um, virtual instance into the network. So using the API, we can really develop a set of uh, really rich constructs. So if we were to develop um, 
say you're migrating a legacy application into the cloud and you want to retain your networking stack because it's one of the benefits when people talk about how do I migrate my legacy, I don't want to reconfigure my network, I just want to take my existing IP address space and bring it in, is we can create, say, some typical networks. Um, maybe I create a tenant network that uses, you know, 192.168. I create another tenant network that uses 172.16. And I create a third network that's really my public network. Um, I use the 10 address space here, but you really you can use any publicly routable address. I get my workload in. We'll add three, we'll add three servers. I want to plug VM1. I want to plug that into tenant network 1. Um, VM network VM2, I want to plug into the second tenant um, network but I also want to plug it into the first one as well in, in three. So using quantum, I can do a construct like this where I can plug my VMs into each network and you know VM2 has two legs into each network. Or alternatively, if I wanted to with the router, I could actually route the traffic between the two networks. The architecture of quantum is really no different than how Nova works. Um, or how any other APIs work. So in, you have the generic APIs in OpenStack. You have the compute API, you have the networking API, you have the storage API. And then those APIs are really front ends for the underlying technology. So in this particular instance, for the compute API, we're using KVM. Uh, for the network API, API we're using um, OVS, which is Open vSwitch. Um, and then for storage, we're, say, using Ceph. Uh, as Mark Collier point, as Jonathan pointed out earlier, there's lots of storage vendors. There's lots of different hypervisor vendors uh, who provide you different options. Same with networking. So we use the generic APIs. It allows portability. The API it also allows consistency between the APIs. And in OpenStack networking, we use a plug-in architecture, so that you can have one networking. So each of the vendors can offer their different solutions, and there's different uh, benefits to using the vendors. Maybe you have lots of gear, existing gear in your data center from a particular vendor. A lot of them will have orchestration and controllers um, to plug in with that. Uh, maybe you're building a data center from scratch or building a deployment from scratch, and you can use different vendor solutions. Sorry, the translation to PowerPoint kind of goofed up my keynote a little bit. But um, when, you, when you talk about the architecture, um, really in terms of quantum, it's really this kind of this middle uh, section, which is the purple area is that generic API. Um, underneath, we have extensions. So you have the generic API that, that you expect to find in every OpenStack networking deployment. And then you have extensions that may expose uh, features unique to the different vendors. Um, some of those extensions are unique to vendors. Some of those extensions are um, APIs that we as a community are trying to develop and iterate on. And we'll release them as extensions to get feedback on how to use them. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a few of those that we're working on currently. And then you have different ways of interacting with that API, either via tenant scripts. You can actually use the um, Horizon uh, GUI which is the OpenStack dashboard. And you can point and click and do, you can use that. Um, you can use orchestration tools such as Heat. And then all those tools talk the same API, use the same interfaces, and then talk to a plugin, which we called Plugin X. But that really could be any one of because we currently, uh, OpenStack networking has 12 of them. So in terms of Grizzly, uh, some of the features that we've released and people in and trying to answer some of the feedback that we've gotten from the community. So one of the biggest ones is metadata. How do you push your keys, your SSH keys, your host keys, and metadata to your guest? And do it in a simplified configuration to make it easier to turn on metadata in Quantum. Um, anybody who ran a Folsom Cloud and needed metadata, we invariably got lots of questions almost every week about why does this not work? Why is it not configured right? Why am I having headaches? And so that's one of the things we took a big look at and how to make it simpler. Um, and supporting overlapping IPs. One of the biggest wins for OpenStack networking and compared to Nova is you can actually have overlapping IPs within tenants and across tenants. So a tenant can have a 192.168.1.0 and another tenant can have the same network, but you still get perfect isolation between all the tenants and their network traffic. Also, we wanted to make uh, metadata service worked on non-routed networks. Maybe you have a back-end database network that you don't want connected to the internet in any way, shape, or form without going through another host. Metadata services still work on that network. One of the other features we worked on is adding security groups. Um, security groups are a way to provide um, 
L3 access rules that protect the virtual interface um, for hypervisor. They don't work at the router level, they actually work a lot lower and protect the host. So they support overlapping IPs, and Nova and Folsom, that didn't work, um, but now you have overlapping IPs. It handles multiple VMs, uh, uh, VMs with multiple NICs, so that if you have three NICs plugged into a VM or three virtual um, interfaces, you can have different security groups for each VIF, depending on what network it's attached to and what rules you want to apply. Maybe you want NIC 1 to only allow web traffic and that you want the database to only be allowed to talk over NIC 3 and so you can isolate and, t and restrict the traffic that flows across those interfaces. Additionally, get ingress and egress rules. So um, traditional Nova would allow ingress rules, which is the traffic flowing into the hypervisor and allow all traffic going out. There really wasn't a way to filter the traffic exiting um, the instance. With uh, OpenStack Networking and Grizzly, we've made it so that you can apply rules both coming and going. Uh, so it really gives you a way to lock down and really tailor security policies. Uh, when we were talking a little bit earlier about what enterprises want, what private deployments need, these are some of the rules that they expect to find. These are some of the rules that they're asking for. And IPv6. You know, everybody talks about IPv6, it's always coming, but yes, it's coming faster and sooner rather than later, especially in certain parts of the world where the IP address range is very constrained. Another one of the benefits is because we use plug-in technology within a community, we have a community implementation that's fairly fast and fairly performant, but some of the plugins can actually offload this into their controllers. Um, if you're using OpenBSwitch or OpenFlow, you can actually write the flow rules so that you can actually reject traffic as part of, as part of the, actual, as part of the um, tunneling system. Load balancing was another feature that we added in, um, in Grizzly. We, we spent some time, uh, some folks here uh, in Israel with Radware um, helped kind of craft that API with lo developing the load balancing API model, making it a pluggable framework. Um, the pluggable framework is experimental in Grizzly. We're working on hardening that. This is one of the features um, come this fall in Havana. Um, that's another enterprise feature. It's another HA feature for deploying your cloud is people want to be able to load balance. They don't want to be able to you know, bring up one server and say this is my web server, they want to be able to have multiples. So that way you can upgrade, you can move shift loads around, you have a lot of flexibility. And a reference implementation uses HA proxy. It works, um, you know, has some limitations. It doesn't do SSL termination, but those are the types of features that you would expect to find in an enterprise um, grade solution, which is where the vendors and the plugin model in OpenStack Networking is very beneficial because the vendors can offer solutions that do SSL termination and other features. We have several new plugins that we've added. Um, during Grizzly, we added five. We have Big Switch, Brocade, Hyper-V, Minicura, and Plum Grid. Um, most recently, coming in Havana, we added uh, Mellanox te Technologies, added theirs. And I expect probably another three or four to land uh, during Havana. So the one encouraging thing about that is that now OpenStack Networking is up to 12, I think we have 12 plugins and growing, and it really speaks to the enthusiasm within the community. So like I said, we have 12 plugins. It's kind of the list of all of them. If you look at them, a lot of vendors you recognize, some vendors, some smaller companies you may not recognize, but they all have different, they all have solutions which support the OpenStack API and the plugin model, but they also offer different um, abilities and capabilities depending on what your backend systems look like. And that's really the power of OpenStack networking is the API is consistent regardless of whose technology you're using. In terms of Horizon, um, one of the things we spent some time with is while, yes, the OpenStack networking team focuses on getting networking working and doing routing and VPNs and um, firewalls of service and IPAM and all those things, we also um, coordinate with the Horizon dashboard team making sure that the GUI experience is good for users of OpenStack. A lot of folks who try OpenStack for the first time will end up with the GUI, they'll sample it a little bit. Some departments actually use it, and some smaller private enterprises use the Horizon API is their way that they provision services. So we want to make sure the graphical views worked um, in terms of multiple NICs, uh, routing, making sure the load balancing control was proper. Um, also, giving a way to visualize the network topology. Unless you're a network engineer, 
you know, looking at numbers, looking at routers, you, a lot of times it's hard to visualize what the topology looks like, how are the VMs plugged in. And so one of the things we've been working on is this was the version in Grizzly and they've already started making some tweaks to make this presentation even better for Havana. Um, in Grizzly, we also made the ability to select uh, which NICs that you're plugging in for an instance. So uh, previously, if you spun up and you got every network you had, now you can say, I want the first uh, interface in this machine to be plugged in this network, the second interface to be plugged into this network. It allows you to, to make configuration easier, so your configuration tools, um, while the networks can support DHCP, some folks needed to use static IPs and one of the networks to be plugged in a specific ones. Other features that we were working on in Grizzly were um, multiple network node support. Again, folks talked about um, HA and making sure that uh, OpenStack, the infrastructure and core infrastructure is reliable. And multiple network node support was one, of the, was one of the key components that we needed to add so that you didn't have a single point of failure within your network. Um, we began a lot of work um, right now you get more of an active passive mode, but with the little manual. And in Havana we're working on in some components actually making it active active in terms of DHCP. I think Gary made changes, now you can run three, five, ten, how many ever DHCP servers you want to give you the amount of, you know, assurance and easy, you know, sleep at night kind of stuff that your DHCP is never going down. So it gives you a lot of, com a lot of configurability without adding a lot of complexity. Um, XML API. Um, for the longest time, the OpenStack networking API was JSON only. Um, but the one thing we, listening to our users, listening to deployers, is there are enterprises that have tool chains and very extensive tool, tool chains that are written for XML that expect XML and work and interact. And so we, it's another one of those cases where you talk about how do features get in OpenStack. It's listening back to the community, talking to the, to the users of OpenStack, and XML was one of those use cases. And we touched on this a little bit earlier, which is the, the upgrade process. Upgrading from S6 to Folsom and networking, you really couldn't do it. You had to write your own custom scripts. There was no seamless uh, path. One of the things that we worked on in Grizzly was is you can take a Folsom database, you can load the code in, say this is my plugin, and OpenStack Networking, the underlying manager, will take care of doing a live migration of your database or Optionally, you have a choice of generating an offline script so that if you want to give it to a DBA, they can go through, they can fine tune the script, you can run, you can test the script on standby servers. It gives you a lot of different options. And the real question everybody asks is, you know, what's coming in, you know, October? What's going to be in the next release? And what are the features that we're talking about? Services was a big um, initiative that we talked about in Portland for, for networking. Um, one of the services is firewall as a service. Enterprises, yeah, five minutes, okay. So enterprise as a service, uh, enterprises wanted firewall as a service. They want the ability to uh, limit the traffic actually entering the virtual network. So you'll see some work for firewalls. Uh, some of the early releases uh, look for them around late June, July. Uh, load balancing, like I said, it was an experimental API in Grizzly. Um, one of the things that the vendors are working on um, currently right now is hardening that API, um, taking the feedback that we've gotten from some of the experiments and in, in making sure it's production ready. Uh, VPN as a service. Again, when you're deploying loads and you have private instances, you want to be able to burst in between maybe um, data centers, you want to burst or you want to connect data centers. Uh, one of the things we're going to be adding is IPsec VPN. Again, these are the enterprise features that private businesses are looking for. They're also beneficial in the cloud because the public providers have a way to expose these very rich tools to even their tenants and their customers. Improved IPv6 support. I've seen this a couple slides. It's kind of a personal thing of mine, but IPv6, it's, it's, a lot of people think it's easy to get right. The downside is, is it's not, um, and it's making sure that we get all the little bugs worked out because as different operating systems and as different people deploy an IPv IPv6, we're getting feedback about different ways. Um, when I was in Portland, I met with a very large user of IPv6 um, in the United States who's looking to deploy OpenStack on IPv6 um, nationwide. Improved bare metal support. Um, goes a little bit with some of the options for triple O and pixie booting in terms of DHCP options, but also if you're looking at SRI, SRIOV or any one of the other offloads. 
updated client library. Again, this is features that we hear back from the user community. And as developers, we're always looking to get that feedback, which is how can we make the client library easier to use and simpler? And then more vendor plugins. Like I said, we have 12 now. I expect we'll probably have 15 or 16 at least. Um, one of the newer uh, initiatives that we're working on is modular in community L is modular L2, so that it's going to make it easier. This is where we're listening to the vendors who are working in OpenStack. How, they, how can we make it easier to write plugins? So we're going modular v L2. We're also going modular L3, so that the vendors have an easier path to get their products to market. Database profiling. At scale, it's really interesting um, running OpenStack. And depending on the deployments, you can actually have different problems. Um, I know Chris touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, at Rackspace, but you can have, when you're running at extremely large scale, you hit problems, and when you're running at even small scales, you'll hit different problems or medium scales, and part of what our challenge is as developers is trying to anticipate what those loads look like at different points and trying to come up with the, a default set that gives you good performance. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong. Um, one of the issues I was dealing with uh, recently has come to my attention where, you know, some of the configuration parameters. So we're taking a look at how the database profiles, how we can improve it, how we can make those queries and, and the application more responsive. And improve testing. Um, OpenStack, ha is, from a developer standpoint, has um, continuous integration tools that are probably the best I've ever used. Um, wherever Monty is in the room, um, you know, huge debt to how he set up everything. Um, because it makes our job as developers, as reviewers, it really enables us to rapidly iterate and rapidly um, innovate because the tools don't get in the way. But one of the things is, is that those tools also expose where we need to improve test coverage, where we need to improve our test cases. Based in, and some of our test cases are based on real life feedback from enterprise and private deployments and public deployments. And then the last thing is Nova Network uh, was the default uh, networking um, in OpenStack for a long time. And now that Quantum or OpenStack Network has matured, one of the things is that that is going to become the default deployment um, in terms of how the dev, the dev stack um, works and how you know the path forward for everybody. Because there's a lot of wins in terms of you don't have you can get tenant isolation out of the box it just works you can bridge in uh, physical networks into private um, networks and all that and so what we're working on during Havana cycle is making Nova no is making Nova network deprecated and promoting uh, OpenStack networking to be the default for all new deployments so one last thing is uh, if you want more information on how OpenStack networking works um, the OpenStack Docs project, which is another excellent feature of OpenStack, has the documentation online, um, has everything from how to install, what are the different options. And then lastly, that's it, really questions.